We're going to go ahead and start here. And um, Simone, let me know if anything appears wrong on your end. Um, we're going to talk about some jigsaw puzzle theory tonight, some jigsaw puzzle history, um, some plain old boring history, some art history. Um, and we're going to move right up to present day and the pandemic. So this story uh, starts back in Cleveland um, during the late 1920s. And, and Cleveland, Ohio, at this point, um, is an economic powerhouse. Um, the, the Union Army during the Civil War used it as their central railroad depot. Um, they ran all their railroads, uh, all their trains through there uh, because of its geographic location. Um, and, um, and then so what the, what the city did with that is they parlayed that into, uh, into industry and um, Rockefeller started Standard Oil there and, uh, and then iron ore was coming down through the Great Lakes. So Cleveland is booming and um, um, right up through 1929. And um, now comes the Great Crash, um, the Great Depression, and the great jigsaw puzzle craze uh, worldwide um, as a result. So uh, lots of people were out of work and um, looking for at home cheap entertainment and jigsaw puzzles fit that bill. And so there was a huge boom worldwide um, of jigsaw puzzle enthusiasm. Um, King George V of King's Speech uh, movie fame, uh, he loved jigsaw puzzles. Benito Mussolini report reportedly, um, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, um, you know, lots of famous people in addition. So. Um, as a result of this jigsaw puzzle craze, um, new companies sprang up everywhere to meet the demand. And one of these companies um, was started by a family in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland. Um, and so it's Chagrin Falls, and the company is called Falls Puzzles. And this was their tagline, fall for a puzzle. And the Falling Down Girl was their logo and also was their signature piece. So a signature piece is a piece that represents the company um, that companies put in all of their puzzles. So with us, it's an eagle piece. Um, with another company called Par, for example, um, they have a seahorse. Anyway, you can see the Falling Down Girl. Um, and she kind of looks the same, but she's not exactly the same because these puzzles are quarter inch plywood and they're hand cut. They're hand cut with a scroll saw. Um, and uh, so this family, uh, the, the father's name was John Paul Jones and um, uh, the mother's name was uh, Mary Bell Jones and she was known as Jimmy. And, and Jimmy um, was the one who cut all the puzzles and John Paul Jones uh, ran the business and he made the boxes and he found the images and prepped the panels for her to cut. So this is the back of a falls puzzle. Um, and you can see immediately that there are um, shapes of characters and whatnot. These are known as whimsy pieces, um, so-called because they're cut on a whim by the puzzle cutter. And so this is also, this is before um, the invention of cardboard puzzles. So there's no such thing yet as die cut puzzles with a grid that you are familiar with that you think of when you think of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, so what they would do, um, you can see here the red that's left over. They would stamp the back of the puzzle um, with all the shapes of the uh, whimsy pieces and they would sand that off later. But what she would do was cut around one of these whimsy pieces and then she would freehand cut between and go to the next whimsy piece. Um, and then you can also see this line down in the middle and then this line going across the middle horizontally. And so what she would do at the very beginning is Jimmy would cut the panel into four quadrants. 
And this would enable, it would give her four smaller panels and give her a much finer cut on the saw. Um, false puzzles um, were among the most intricate ever cut and so much so um, that they are still one of the top three brands sought after by jigsaw puzzle collectors to this day. Next one. Um, here's another back of a false puzzle. And again, you can see where she cut it across the middle here. Uh, give herself uh, some more accuracy on the saw. Um, so false puzzles not only had a lot of whimsy pieces, um, they had some complex scenes and these are, we call these interrelated whimsy pieces. So here's a couple sitting at a table. Um, Next one is another couple sitting at a table and a waiter with a tray. Okay, here's a, a Jolly Fellows uh, dancing with two women. And um, this one is even expressing some action. So here we have some, a feature in art known as contraposto. So his upper body is twisting and his lower body is twisting away. Um, some famous contraposto in art. We have Michelangelo's David and The Birth of Venus by Botticelli. Um, both of those artworks are located in Florence. Uh, here's another compost uh, in a related whimsy scene. We have a full wedding. Here's a bridesmaid, a bridesmaid, a bride, a groom, the altar, and the preacher. Now, in this little scene, you can also see candlesticks. One, two, three, four. So what Jimmy would do is, is put a whole bunch of something small in, like candlesticks or in some other puzzles, it's little dogs. And they all kind of look the same. So you come across and you're like, oh, I need a candlestick. And then you look on your table and you've got 40 candlesticks sitting there. So you have to search through all those. So that was a way of, of her slowing the puzzlers down. Um, okay, so speaking of uh, weddings, uh, we now come to the uh, portion of the program with royal intrigue. And we're in the mid 30s, so it has to be this couple. Uh, many of you probably know who this is. On your left is Wallace Simpson, um, Baltimore socialite, twice divorced. And, um, and, the, and the fellow on the right, that is um, Edward VIII, former Prince of Wales, he became the King of England. And he subsequent, his father was George V of the speech impediment and um, jigsaw puzzle loving. Um, uh, the, the Church of England was none too happy about, um, about this relationship. And they basically said, we forbid you from marrying this woman. And he was completely head over heels in love with her. Um, he loved her irreverence towards the royals and, you know, pretty much everything else, I think. Um, and so what he ultimately did was he abdicated the throne. And so he stepped down. Um, he, his younger brother, who was the uh, uh, Prince of York, Duke of York. Anyway, um, this couple subsequently became um, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Um, now... Here's the connection. So here's Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson. Um, and this, uh, this couple up here is my great, great grandfather and grandmother. Um, Eileen, as she was known, was a huge patron of, of the false puzzles. She had a huge, she bought a huge number of these puzzles. Um, and so she knew Jimmy personally. Um, we have some notes that have uh, notes from Jimmy to Eileen. And Eileen and Lawrence knew the royal couple because he was in the forest, foreign service at one point. Um, so uh, my uh, great, 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 great grandparents um, lived just outside of Cleveland. Um, and again, they knew Jimmy Jones. Now there's also a possibility that John Paul Jones, who, who was from uh, Baltimore originally, knew Wallace from there somehow. So we're not entirely sure. Um, this is my favorite slide of the uh, program. Um, this is Edward VIII as king. There's Wallace in the background. Um, you can see what's in the foreground. I don't think that that is actually a false puzzle. Um, 
but this is the deck of the HMS Britannia. So this is, this is pre-abdication um, and they clearly have a relationship at this point. Um, here's a book of letters, uh, most a uh, lot from, uh, from and to Wallace Simpson um, that I have. And the money quote, one of them, Wallace, this is Wallace writing to um, her aunt Bessie stateside I can't get over the jigsaw puzzle thing. What happened was that Walter Prendergast gave me two in South of France made in Chagrin Falls. They were the best I have ever seen. Then Eileen Winslow sent me two by Ian Russell's same make. The prince loved them and they were a great help at weekends. So I wired Eileen to send him a dozen. And also I took one to Harrods and asked them to order some as I'm sure there'll be a hit over there, over here. The two Eileen sent to the print sent the prince took to Sandringham and the king and queen did them and have asked him for more. So this begins kind of the real heyday of false puzzles um, and they start making huge ones for the royal family. Uh, and then they also made a whole bunch and sold them through Herod's. So Jimmy was overwhelmed and she ultimately at one point had three uh, other women helping her cut the puzzles. Um, and, uh, and then by the, by the end of the depression, um, at, at the Falls family, the Jones family, um, were basically just sick of making puzzles. So as soon as he could get other work, they stopped making them ultimately. Now, um, once Edward abdicated the throne, um, they were highly unpopular in England. And so what they did was they fled to the south of France um, where they hold up and what did they do? They were doing jigsaw puzzles. Now, if you're on the run and you're trying to avoid publicity uh, and you're very unpopular, here's what I don't recommend doing. Um, here's the uh, royal couple with a uh, notorious uh, historical figure. Um, and um, there's another photo that I found online with them with, with Richard Nixon and, um, and, and Edward, I was gonna put it in the slideshow, I, then Edward died in the, I think in 1973-ish, and if he had lasted another year, I was thinking I could get a, a, a another decade, I could have gotten them maybe with Donald Trump and gone for the di trifecta there. Uh, all right, we leave the hapless uh, royals now. Um, I just wanted to give you uh, uh, a feel for what the boxes look like. They didn't have the technology back then to reproduce images. And so they just had a plain box like this on the top is just, is just that striped pattern. Um, and they had, they had a title and then number of pieces. Um, and then uh, one of my family's traditions, and a lot of people used to do this, is on the back of the box, um, they would write the date and sometimes the names or locations of the people who assembled the puzzle and when they did it. And so each one kind of has its own little historical um, sort of uh, uh, information on it. Um, so here's the back of that one. Queen Mary's collection of jade done for second or third time, August 18th, 1940. Done for the last time, July 12th, 1941. Redone, second, second February, 1956, a horrid collection. So sometimes little pieces of family history or commentary that are funny. Um, here's, uh, here's my collection of false puzzles. Um, my mom, uh, and dad, my mom, my mom and dad are on this call, by the way. Hi, mom. Um, my mom didn't show these to us, uh, as, uh, my sister and I, until we were in our sort of mid early teens, um, because they're too valuable and she didn't want us breaking them and, um, they're fragile. Um, and so, but ultimately, um, they became a family obsession. And um, so we're leaving the false puzzles now. Um, fast forward uh, about another decade and um, we're in Puerto Vallarta on a family vacation. We started not being able to go on family vacations without the false puzzles. And we're sitting there all day on a rainy day and um, just having the best time doing this puzzle. And, and that's when kind of the light bulb went off for me. Uh, we're talking 2002 here, uh, 2003 maybe. 
Um, and I said out loud, you know, I bet if I could make and sell these for a hundred bucks, uh, that, that could be a successful business. And so what the idea was originally for me, and now we're kind of getting into a little bit of jigsaw puzzle theory, was jigsaw puzzle as social vehicle. Because you're sitting there around a table and it's not like you're playing cards or chess or a game where you really have to focus on what's going on. You can really passively do a puzzle and have a great conversation at the same time. And so it really is, it's jigsaw puzzle as social vehicle. So that was the original concept. And then toward the end, we'll talk about some other things that helped us along the way. But finally, um, quit my finance job and started Liberty Puzzles in 2005. Um, we spent about a year in manufacturing testing, trying to figure out how to make them. And then we finally came to market uh, early fall 2005. Um, that's me in the foreground with uh, much darker hair than I have now. Um, that's my business partner in the back, Jeff. He's still my business partner. He runs the business. I kind of run the creative side and the, and the manufacturing oversight. Here we are at... Uh, uh, the Toy Fair in New York City at the Javits Center, um, where we were we exhibited. We used to sell um, a lot of wholesale, um, and we stopped most of our wholesale about seven years ago, except we're still in a couple of um, kind of feather in our cap accounts, like art museums and the like. Uh, that's our modern updated logo. Here's one of our cut patterns, just to give you some idea of what they look like. Uh, that's, you know, you can see it looks a lot like a falls cut pattern. We jam as many whimsy pieces as, in as we can. And nowadays we've evolved to the point where we theme most of the whimsy pieces to the puzzle image itself. So this is the file that is hand drawn by my puzzle designer. Um, he hand draws all those whimsy pieces and then he, and then he outlines them and the computer, and then he hand draws all these little connector pieces, which we call earlets. So this, this is about a 500 piece puzzle right here. Uh, this takes him probably about, you know, 16 to 20 hours in total. And this is what it looks like when it's cut from the back. So again, back to the pattern and back to the back. This the, here's the front of this one. Um, this is a contemporary artist. This one is called Matisse Studio. Here's some Liberty um, interrelating whimsy pieces. This couple's dancing, this fellow sloshing his cocktail. Uh, the Three Graces, movie star and the paparazzi, making s'mores. Uh, this is what we call a complex whimsy piece with multiple pieces forming one. So this is a bird with a four piece bird cage around it. Uh, here's another example um, of a fish within a fish within a fish, kind of like uh, nested Russian dolls, if you will. Uh, here's the chipmunk tipping over the vase, and this is my tip for the segue. So we've talked about uh, kind of what, what our puzzles look like, and now we're going to talk about um, what kind of images make good jigsaw puzzles. And there's no such thing as a Dewey Decimal System for images. Um, so we, what we do, we try and categorize ours. Uh, we offer about 600 standard offerings. And we probably have another 300 that we've delisted that didn't sell as well. Um, 600 feels like a good kind of um, amount for us. And so I'm just gonna run you through a couple categories here and examples to give you some idea of what works and what doesn't work. Um, the first category is kind of classical paintings that are, that are famous and popular. Um, it could be anything from, say, this Vermeer up to an Albert Bierstadt, which would be a big Western landscape. Um, we would also ca categorize the Bierstadt under Americana. Um, but this Vermeer is called the Concert. Um, if you've seen this painting recently, let me know, and I will help us uh, collect the reward for it. 
Um, this painting has been missing for over 30 years. It was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in the spring of 1990. And this is the crown jewel in the trove that they stole, which is supposedly worth now close to a billion dollars. This painting alone is probably worth $700 million. Uh, nobody knows where it is. So um, back in 2010, we did a whole catalog on famous paintings that have been stolen. Um, and we featured that one on the front. Next category is Impressionism. People love their Impressionists. They love their Renoirs, their Degas. Um, this is a Monet. This one is called Impression Sunrise. Um, it is the painting from which the entire Impressionist movement was named. Um, and also this painting fits in the stolen art cal uh, category. It was stolen at gunpoint in 1985 and recovered five years later in Corsica. Um, stolen at gunpoint in Paris, and now it's back in its rightful place on the museum wall. Um, next category is Asian art. Um, people love Japanese prints. This is obviously a very famous one by Hokusai, uh, The Great Wave, and you can see my puzzle designer irreverently putting the surfer guy so that he's surfing the mouth of the wave here. Um, Hiroshige is the most popular uh, Japanese printmaker that we have, that we offer, we probably offer 30 of his prints. Here's one that's a little more obscure. This one is called Fudo Falls. And in the late uh, 19th century, um, all things Japanese were quite popular in Europe, particularly in France and Paris. And the ships would come over with goods and sometimes they would have items wrapped in extra, um, extra prints like this. And then sometimes there would just be stacks of these prints. Um, and these caught this kind of art style caught the idea, caught the um, the caught the eye of the impressionist painters. And this kind of floating form, like these trees here, and these blocks of color, and this like floating, um, these all the floating waterfall, these all. Uh, all these features inspired the Impressionists and affected their thinking and their, and their development as painters. Next category is Americana. Um, this is, uh, this is the uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence. And this is by Robert Trumbull. Um, the painting is huge. It's uh, the original. It's a 12 foot by 18 foot and it hangs in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. Um, which I believe has been in the news recently. Um, let's see. Next category is maps, um, especially illustrated ones like this with a lot of color, um, really nice textures and, and lots of stuff happening in them. This is the city of the big shoulders. Um, done in uh, typical uh, Liberty whimsy fashion with the World's Fair Ferris wheel and Al Capone himself with his getaway car. Um, vintage prints are really good. This is a, a, a good example of, of really nice textures. Uh, vintage travel posters are really, really popular. Um, Art Nouveau, uh, Alphonse Mucha dominates that category. This is Rose. Uh, a lot of holiday images. Um, I resisted and tried to dig my heels in in the early years because I, I, I didn't like the gimmicky nature of the holiday stuff. They're just so popular. Uh, we do all the, the various big holidays. Um, Easter, Valentine's Day, we do July 4th, we have Halloween, uh, we do Thanksgiving and the ubiquitous, like we offer like 80 different Santas and whatnot. Uh, contemporary artists, um, this is probably our biggest category. We license from about 50 uh, contemporary artists. Um, this is a woman named Suko Chia. She's from Washington State. She's our most popular single art. We offer about 30 of her animals like this. So here's what the back of this one looks like. Um, 
it's an irregular shaped one, so not a rectangle or a square. Here's the whimsy set for the turtle that you were just looking at. The complex surfers here, complex octopus, orca, and what have you. Photography. In the beginning, um, I thought that photography would be a huge category for us. And this is one of two images that we currently offer that are photographs. Um, and photographs really just don't make very good puzzles. Um, invariably, you have too much sky, like here. Sky and clouds are really boring to put together. Um, invariably, you have too much sky, sand, water, foliage, snow, whatever it is in the background. Uh, they also don't tend to have the full color spectrum. Um, so the best puzzle images have really good full color spectrum. So this is distinctly lacking reds, for example. And um, now we come to the final category that I want to talk about, which is um, uh, post-impressionism. Um, this is obviously Van Gogh's most famous piece. This hangs in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Um, and is stunning, by the way, uh, in real life. But so I'm just going to talk about copyright briefly. Um, anything much past Van Gogh, you get into copyright problem issues. Um, so if it's a contemporary artist, like I was saying, uh, we are licensed from about 50 of them. Um, if I can call them on the phone, usually, and because they're living, and usually we got a deal in like five minutes. The problem um, is where you have artists, sort of mid 20th century artists that are still under copyright, but have been dead several generations. And so you, what you're dealing with is an estate. And so I'm talking about artists like MC Escher or Pablo Picasso or Salvador Dali. Um, I mean, those the, the Dali estate people have their nose way, 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 way up in the air. Um, one example that I was successful with that's like that is Dr. Seuss. And that deal took me a full year to negotiate. And they're wonderful people over at Dr. Seuss Enterprises, actually right near most of you in San Diego. Um, they're really great people. They just have multiple layers of review and it's all very dear to them and it's totally understandable. Um, so it's just more complicated if you're dealing with an estate. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna attempt. So that kind of concludes, oh, that was much quicker than I thought. Um, I'm gonna stop the share here. So uh, one thing I didn't uh, mention during, uh, when we were talking about photography is that normally uh, when, we, when we're not having the pandemic, we allow people to submit their own custom artwork. And most people submit photographs for that. We do a lot of uh, uh, family photos, wedding photos, vacation photos, vacation home photos, um, or whatnot. And that's usually about 10% of our business. And it just, it slows us down quite a bit to do a one-off like that. Um, we, have to, we have to do a bunch of setup to get that done. And so we stopped during, doing that um, as of March last year when the pandemic hit um, because, um, and we'll maybe talk about the pandemic and the Q and A. So we currently don't offer custom puzzles, um, but we will we will be back with them, you know, eventually. And so um, that kind of concludes my presentation. Um, Simone, what do you think? Couple minute break and then take Q and A, or I don't have to break. It's up to you. I think you know we can go for it because people want to take you know their own breaks. That's cool, and everybody should be able to um, start your video. I finally figured it out. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone. Uh, and we should be good to go. I've given you all the ability to unmute yourselves. And right. Sorry. Yep, okay. It's working. Honey. Yay. Yay. <laughs> well, as long as it's a break, I just want to say to Mr. and Mrs. Worth, who were tuned in, uh, and as I recall, Senator and Mrs. Worth, if I have that right, 
Uh, you did a great job bringing up this kid. As you know, he and I have been in touch since and just gives as naturally as he breathes and all of those things that uh, fathers and mothers want to know about their kid. So uh, just to let you know that from a Richard letter, I remember our meeting at St. Paul's and way to go. He did a good job. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. This is Jim and Barbara. I, I was, we were hoping that you'd show us how the puzzles are made, the manufacturing process. Um, that, that's a, uh, that's a fair question. We usually don't um, reveal that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any footage of that. They are laser cut. Um, they're in a machine that kind of looks like a photocopier and um, it's got an XY axis and there's an optics carriage. The laser beam bounces off a bunch of mirrors and then goes straight down. We cut them uh, um, so it kind of, it zooms around the table. Um, the, the bed size is 18 by 24 on most of our lasers. And um, let's see, we cut them back to front. So when you saw the turtles, you saw the back, um, that was looking at it from the top when you're looking down into the laser bed. And the reason we do that is that um, the kerf of the laser is 50 thousandths of an inch wide. And, um, but what happens when it's cutting through the quarter inch plywood is it's incinerating wood on either side. So it, it ends up not being a straight line cut. It ends up being a very narrow V. And what we want is the, the, v, the v tip um, to be on the front. So aesthetically, uh, that's the tightest. Um, so again, I apologize, I don't have footage of the lasers cutting. Um, How long does it take to cut one puzzle? Uh, it currently, with a, our current machines, it takes about 45 minutes on average. It really depends on the size and the machine over time. They're, they're 75 watt machines. Over time, that declines. We run them really hard here, about uh, 14 hours a day. And so over time, that power output declines and that slows it down. So the laser operators are looking at every puzzle that comes out and over time that power is declining. So they have to slow subsequent jobs down. Um, I would say on average about 45 minutes, we've got a new platform coming at our new facility that we're currently building that's gonna run them uh, twice as fast in about 20, 25 minutes. Chris, uh, Chris you, you, uh, I think you said you might talk about the jigsaw puzzle during the pandemic. Um, and uh, I think we'd be interested in that. Uh, my guess is that business is booming. I'm wondering how you're able to keep up and what people have been doing with jigsaw puzzles during the pandemic. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Thursday or Friday, the, kind of the week before the national lockdown, um, and this thing started really becoming real, in March and people realized what was about to happen, they started planning for it and our sales skyrocketed like December times two rates. And so um, we started panicking and then our website was on all weekend and we got like 10,000 orders. And by the time we could get it shut off Monday morning, we had this huge backlog of orders. We can only make 500 a day. And so, um, then we subsequently had to shut down. And so we had to just keep our website turned off. Um, and because uh, there were only three or four of us allowed to come in here and manufacture. And so during the two months we were shut down, we kind of chipped away at that list um, until we were able to op open back up in May. Um, so at the time of the onset of the pandemic, we were set to build a, uh, we were about to open a second facility because we already had too much demand. So we were about to open a second factory. And what we had to do was during the shutdown, we had to pivot. And instead of increase, doubling our capacity, we had to use that new space to spread all of our existing people out to be able to operate safely. So we were able to reopen in May, but we weren't able to increase our capacity yet. Um, so now we have a third facility that we're working on right now. 
So when we reopened in May, uh, we had all this pent up demand and still huge demand from everyone being on lockdown. It's the perfect at home activity, of course. Um, and so jigsaw puzzles uh, worldwide were just overwhelmed. Everyone was. And to this day, so when we opened back up in May, um, we, would, we, we could only sell 500 a day because uh, that's how many we can make. And we didn't want to just open it up and get another huge backlog because we're subject to shutting down any day because of the pandemic. So it's, it's operating in scary times. It's manufacturing. It's, you know, it's people have to really work with each other and work closely with each other. Um, so it's scary. So we would, we would open the website every day in May um, at 10 a.m., and we would get our daily allotment within three minutes. Um, and so that, that wasn't really a fair way of doing it, um, especially with people who weren't internet savvy. They had just absolutely no chance of getting one. So we had to implement a shopping token system whereby you waited in line for till, until you got to the front of the line and then you got your token and you could use that to buy one single unit. Um, so that's the, that's the, uh, the system that we still have in place right now, um, and we've got 30,000 people waiting in line just to buy one. Um, so it's it's been just absolutely crazy. It was a, a different kind of holiday season for us because every day looks the same. I mean, we just released our 600, it released the 600, released the 600. Um, we do have a third facility coming online early second quarter of this year, which will triple our output. And so we'll, we're, we're hiring about uh, another 100, 120 people in the next three months. Great. Well, Chris, I love, I love your puzzles. I have to admit, I'm the recipient of two of these. My son went to CU Boulder and he uh, discovered them uh, at uh, your flagship store there. And I think the two neatest things about these, I mean, besides the, the whimsy pieces is uh, when you open them up, the paper, it's so nice that there's paper, they're wrapped in paper. And then the smell of the wood yeah. is just wonderful. Show, it, show it, your puzzle, Lisa. They're so unique. Yeah. Uh, this is the interior of St. Peter's. Wow. And I have wheat fields with cypresses by Van Gogh. Oh, and this pretty. is the first oh. my son gave me. And I just was beside myself the first time I opened it up and I could smell the wood. The pieces almost click the way they go together is so nice. There's a nice feel to them. And again, the having the tissue paper on there, they're just, they're so nice. They're just wonderful, wonderful gifts to, uh, to give or definitely to receive. <laughs> so thanks for what you do. I, I, I really enjoyed this. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, hey, Rich, just to follow up one more point on the on the current state of the market. If you go on eBay and you search for Liberty Puzzles, people are selling used ones for three times retail right now. Oh, boy. It's unbelievable. Thank you. I wanted to ask a technical question. When you were doing the wave and you put the surfer in there, it kind of implies that sometimes the artist works with a photograph that's already on the puzzle. It may probably in reverse so that you can get it into the correct positions. And then that brings kind of a follow on. When people are ordering custom puzzles, do you take and make a new puzzle for every one of them? Or do you use a kind of a standard cutout and just lay it on top? Yep. Uh, those are great questions. So the answer to the first part is that, yes, the artist does look at the image um, when he is um, when he's when he's assembling or you know making his composition, and so he flips the image, um, so he's looking at it upside right. down, and then he's drawing directly, so he can do locational appropriate stuff like that. So, for example, we have a map of America, and he's got the gator over Florida, he's got the Longhorn over Texas, <laughs> you know Johnny Appleseed over Ohio, um, on and on, you know Statue of Liberty, on and on, just like that. Um, and so the answer to your next question is that we do, you know, when we get a, a custom image comes in, we look at it and it has a certain dimensions. So we have about 1600 cut patterns available to us. And so a lot of those are standard sizes if it's a photograph coming. So it's a three, four aspect ratio or two, three. 
And those are the two most common sizes. So we have tons of templates that fit that. So if you submit a ski vacation photo, you're gonna get skiers and snowflakes and whatnot. So we try and do that. We definitely do not have time to do 20 hours of drawing. I was gonna say, I was wondering about that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I've, I've got a question, actually a couple of questions, uh, which, since I'm a retired engineer, are rather process related. First one is, uh, can you share with us the kind of wood that goes into your plywood? Or did I misunderstand it? Are you using plywood or are you? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, we use a uh, very simple three ply uh, maple veneer front and back uh, and then a poplar core. Um, the that comes from a mill in Oregon. Um, we go out to the mill periodically. Uh, we're pretty small fry for them. Their biggest customer, for example, is Home Depot. Um, but it's it's very simple. Um, the maple's pretty nice. And um, you know, back back in 2005, we tested probably 150 different kinds of plywood um, to get to to this one. Um, I know other companies use different kinds. I don't know exactly. Okay, well, I, I would understand that for, from a handling point of view, it would be helpful for both of the sides to be the same so you wouldn't have to worry too much about which way you were oriented when you put it into the machine. But I could also imagine that you would need a uh, finer, perhaps harder surface for the image than you would for the other side. Um, yeah, it just so happens that we just use the same. I think it's a B2 grade, um, you know, the letter referring to the face and the underside, the number referring to the underside. Uh, I'm not totally familiar with the vagaries of the plywood industry, but um, ours are actually slightly less than quarter inch. I think they're five millimeters um, mm -hmm. because that is what the industry generally uses. Um, there's all kinds of stuff related to the the plywood that for the reason we go out to Oregon sometimes and, and visit the people at the mill, um, plywood is made at, at mills around the country. And what they do is in, the, in those layers, uh, they put glue in between. And what the various mills do is they put um, these little tiny metal flecks that are different colored in the glue lines so that later on, any kind of plywood can be traced back to a particular mill. Well, for us, that's a non-starter because as the laser's cutting through, if it hits one of those metal flecks, it refracts back and it stops cutting. And so that was a major issue for us. And it took us years to get them to remove those. Um, and so what they do now is they flush their glue lines before they run our wood. I would, along that same line, I would mention that I've seen this uh, video on the Japanese television. And there's a company there making plywood where they're using paper layers. And so as a consequence, no reflection, you could still laser cut, but now you could have color lines on the edges. I don't know if you bind your edges or how you treat your puzzle edges, but it would make an interesting color change for you. Yeah, that, that is interesting. And you would be able to see it better if, um, if you got like a hand cut puzzle, like with a scroll saw, the way I was talking about, what happens to our edges when they, when they get cut is they're being burned. So if you look at the edges of our puzzles, they're browned. But what about on the what about on the edges, the outside edge? You don't cut the outside edge, do you? Oh no, the, no, the outside edge. I mean, I'm I'm talking about the the outside edge is the same as the inside edges. Okay, so you're cutting you're cutting out of a larger panel then. Oh, uh, we are. Yep, yep, slightly larger panel. Oh, okay. Not... Never mind, <laughs> as Emily Latella would say. <laughs> yes. A question. Shoot. Question. Um. So you obviously, you're not making this, the, the paper puzzles at all. Can you talk about how any of the paper puzzle making might be different from the way you do it? Um, number one. And then I had another question in there too, which will pop back to me later. Um, absolutely. I, I, I'm not super familiar with the cardboard industry. Um, those are die cut. And so that's just one metal stamp, boom. And so I would imagine a lot of them are made in China. I would imagine there's a machine like boom, 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 boom. And they just cut them like in one second each. 
you know, versus oh, do, do they use the, the same, they were the same pattern uh, in the same configuration of pieces for a hundred different pictures then? Absolutely. That's why they always, all of them look the same, like a grid. Ah, that would be interesting to put together pieces of puzzles. <laughs> I just want to mention that last question was asked by a former Mr. Mensa, Ed Yu, uh, more years ago than we want to talk about, but at any rate, uh, Ed, that was Ed Yu there on your screen, you. Mr. Mensa. Thank you very much. If, if I could interject a little bit, I did work at, at one time for a company that made what's called a steel rule die, and they used a laser to cut the panel to put the steel rules into, and a steel rule is like, imagine you're you know, a ruler, the steel ones, so you could use a little small one and they sharpen the edge and you buy that stuff already sharpened and then you punch it into the lines that have been cut into the thicker panel of plywood. And then that whole thing, it goes in a, what's called a clicker press and it just presses the thing and cuts it one swell swoop. Interesting. So I have a question. Um, I'm wondering from an environmental standpoint um, about any scrap wood and um, the sawdust, that sort of thing. What, what happens with all of that? Um, that's a good question. We, uh, we, have, uh, we have that environmental mindedness to us in everything we do. Um, but there's, uh, so for example, when we when we're laser cutting the panel, um, we emit smoke. Um, that's wood smoke, like it smells like a campfire. Um, and so at our new facility, we're trying to come up with a filtration system for the smoke. So we're not emitting that into the atmosphere. Um, and that filtration system for a new hundred laser building is uh, gonna run us about a million dollars. Um, so that's not just environmentally minded, that's for our neighbors in mind as well. Um, in terms of our scrap wood, we try and uh, be as economical as possible. So a 13 by 17 puzzle, for example, that's 500 pieces. That panel might be 13 and a quarter inches by 17 and a quarter inches. So we're only wasting just a little bit of wood. Um, so we have that in mind. We're cutting those panels really close to the size that we need. And then there's also inefficiencies as well. Those sheets from the mill come to us as four by eight, four feet by eight feet. And there's, uh, we try and be as efficient as possible, um, but there's still some waste there. So we take that scrap wood, sometimes we give it to schools, um, art departments and schools. Um, some, sometimes it gets thrown away. It just, um, you know, there is an unfortunate, um, you know, side to manufacturing where there is necessarily some waste. Uh, but we are highly mindful of that. We also take some of the old puzzles that don't make it through and we got all the whimsy pieces and we bring them down to the store and people can pick their own whimsy pieces. So that's another way we recycle. We also have a um, place where all the puzzles go. We can pick out pieces that have, that someone has lost so we can send pieces out that uh, we do replacement pieces, so um, this is a reminder. We're always trying to do in some way, um, and and um, what, how else do we do that? Yeah, a lot of a lot of dog chewed pieces out there. Um, we can make replacement pieces. Usually, we do that for free unless you know someone is 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 abusive of that process. Um, what Sage interestingly, what Sage was just alluding to is. Um, we have about a, a manufacturer fail rate. And so of any job initiated, about 8% will fail at some point in the process. Um, that could be due to a wood quality issue, a laser issue, a human error issue. Um, so, um, you know, it can fail in a lot of steps of the process. And, but if it's made it through most of the way, like Sage was saying, we give out whimsy pieces, especially to kids down at our store um, and, um, and, re and make replacement pieces for people um, who lose or, or, or get them chewed or what, whatnot. Where are your manufacturing facilities? Um, we're sitting in- Let's talk about the wall of shame. 
in in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, all three of uh, all three of them are located in Boulder here in Boulder, Colorado. Thank you. How many puzzles do you make a year? Chris, talk about the wall of shame. The wall of shame. Oh yeah. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Let me just. Um, hang on a second. Yeah, what say just uh, so the dog chewed pieces. Um, if you admit that your dog chewed the piece and you need a replacement piece, the requirement is that you send a photo of the offending animal. And so, um, in in one of our rooms here at the, our main factory, we have what's called the wall of shame with all the dog pictures on it. Um, it's a major attraction uh, for our tours, which we currently are not doing um, because of the pandemic. Uh, we usually run, you know, five to 10 tour groups a day. Um, and that's a major highlight of the tour is the wall of shame. What was the, what was the other question? Did anybody else ask? Um, I don't know. Whoever the, asked the other question, please repeat it. Yeah. Oh, I asked how many puzzles do you make right. a year? Um, we've grown about 30% a year since 2005. And um, if you are, if you're all Mensa, so you know how to do math, that's ge geometric, that starts getting out of hand really fast. Um, you know, I, right now the math is about 600 a day. Um, we're hoping to get up to close to 2000 a day by midsummer this year. Wow, that's a lot of puzzles. It's a, <laughs> it is a lot of puzzles. Are you considering doing any trick puzzles like Stave? Well, we do have, I didn't show those in the presentation. Um, we do, not the way Stave does them, um, but we do have lots of tricks like that. And um, so we've got a, a Japanese puzzle, for example, where various pieces form a 3D origami crane. Um, we have a Christmas one where a bunch of the pieces can be formed into a 3D Christmas tree. Um, and we call those tricks uh, Easter eggs. They're hidden within the puzzle. Um, usually we don't tell customers about those. But if you look on our website, um, we have a series of photos of each product. Um, and usually the last photo will show the Easter egg if there is one in there. Um, other examples are, include alternate solutions. So you can rearrange the pieces out of the rectangle and it becomes a uh, stag head or something like that. Um, so we do have some special stuff like that, but not exactly what you're asking about the way Stave does it. We, I, I personally find those to be really annoying and, and impossible, but that's, you know. Would you be I, I had, my mother gave me a few of them and they are impossible. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, we, you just have to rearrange it a zillion different ways until it works. Would you consider doing a Mensa puzzle? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we're not, we don't, we're right at the moment, um, we get inquiries all the time right now. We're, at the moment, we're not doing any custom work. We're not doing any bulk orders and we're not doing um, um, any discounted orders right now. It's just straight up what we offer on our website. We're trying to be as nimble and as fast as possible um, to, to try and you know meet some of that frustration and demand that's out there. So a lot of our customers are really frustrated right now and understandably so. How do you get the picture onto the puzzle and are, is all of your picture product the same? Yes, um, so the print so we, we use uh, some wide format Epson printers and Epson paper. Uh, it's a special coated paper, so it can withstand the laser cut and the cleaning process afterward. Um, so the puzzle print itself is really fancy inkjet. Um, and that part of the process is the most expensive single step. So the prints probably cost about $5 each. The inks are very, very expensive. Um, they have to be OEM, um, which means they're, they're Epson. Um, that's where they get you. Um, so yes, that's, and then so that print is subsequently trimmed down. Uh, we have an entire mounting department. So they'll trim it right to the edge of the print exactly on the line. And then they will pre-cut all those panels 
to have as much uh, as little waste as possible. And then they use a special, basically it's a double sided tape industrial adhesive that is used to adhere um, to the panel itself. Um, like I was saying back in 2005, I mean, we, we, we tested probably 50 kinds of glue. Um, we came up with this system. Um, once it's mounted onto the panel, it gets treated, um, it cures. Um, so there's some proprietary parts of that process. And, um, and then about two or three hours later, it's ready to be laser cut. I have a question. Is it possible to, once you've completed the puzzle, to glue it together and frame it? Um, it, it is possible. Um, the reason we don't like glue is it's too permanent a solution. Um, we do offer the puzzle frames and um, we sell those through our website. We have uh, just a simple black metal border and then plexiglass on the front and back. Um, the plex won't break, um, which, is, which is helpful, but it's, it's kind of cool to be able to see the backside and, and look at the intricate cut. Oh. Um, so, but you don't need to glue it to get it into our frames. Um, and we have never tested glue because we don't like the permanence of that, but we have heard from customers that a lot of people do glue them and put them and they don't, they don't frame them. They just glue them and they use them as, on their coffee table as, as uh, you know, coasters or whatnot. Okay, thanks. Question, um, what's the average amount of time it takes to complete one of your puzzles versus a standard paper puzzle? Like, do you count that in terms of man hours? Or yeah. Or one person or whatever. And then the second question is, what is, what is your average price for a puzzle? Um, average price is $100. Thank have, you. We have smaller puzzles that are seven, seven inches wide that sell for 49 and then on up to to about um what 450 is the most expensive mm -hmm. um, it depends on the size the average price as sage was saying is about a hundred dollars um we and, do it based on piece count so yeah a hundred hundred dollar puzzle has about 500 pieces okay right and then in terms of how long it takes to assemble um it that really depends on number one, the skill of the puzzlers, um, but also the image itself. I mean, if you think of just, if you had all white, um, that would be a lot harder. Um, the whimsy pieces do tend to make it slightly easier because the inverse of those whimsies is easier to find if you're just looking at a bunch of cardboard pieces that all look the same. Um, so in that sense, ours tend to be slightly easier than a plain cardboard puzzle. And what is the number of hours that it would actually take to do one of yours <laughs> as an average from an right. average person and versus right. the average of the paper that it's all those little pieces? Yeah. So um, about 70% of our offerings are the 500 piece range. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the most popular size because a group of four adults, for example, can do that in maybe four to five hours in one evening or two evenings. And okay. so that's the most popular size. And so that's what we offer the most of. Okay, so four people times five hours, okay, 20 hours per. Okay, Thank, I, just because I have no sense of time because I don't do a lot of puzzles, but I have a friend that's really into it. And I wonder how many hours does it take to do something versus if you had more people? Thank you. I just want to say I'm a really big fan of Liberty Puzzles. I love my LA by Night puzzle. <laughs> also, I, want, I had a question. Um, what is the highest piece count puzzle that you have made? Um, yeah, we had one um, that we were able to, the image lent itself to being split down the middle so we could cut it in two jobs and so that was about 1,400 pieces, 1,600 pieces. Um, I don't, we don't offer that one currently. Um, uh, in general, our extra large puzzles, the biggest ones we can fit in our laser bed are about eight or 900 pieces. Um, map, world math is over, is a thousand. Yeah. Yeah, so in that, in that range, most of them again are in the 500 piece range. 
I like just have one, to. Like the one you had there, Tammy. Yeah, LA by night. Yeah, 588. I love this puzzle so much. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to throw in, it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole when you visit the Liberty website because <laughs> there are so many fascinating puzzles and, and all different sizes. I'm, I'm just a huge fan. So I know it's hard to pick from all of them. Question, what is your most um, popular work that you've sold? Which one picture piece? Dogs in a um, remember that sea turtle I said I was our most uh, popular artist? Her grizzly bear, I think, is our top seller of all time. Do you have a picture of that? Uh, website, probably. Yeah, if you if you go on our website, um, just, just libertypuzzles.com, um, one of those middle buttons, is it says search, and you can just type in grizzly and you can see it. Um, you could also put in her last name, which is Cochia, C-O-C-C-I-A. And you can see, you know, all 25, 30 of her animals that we offer. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Sure. So my, my question, I, I have this one, which on the website said it's one of the harder puzzles. And I think I've done it three or four times now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't find it to be too bad. My mother, my mother thought this one was easier. I thought this one was harder. I thought this one was easier. Um, so first off, I have to thank you because you have saved my mother and I a fortune in therapy. Um, I got her into them and we swapped puzzles back and forth and it's made our relationship so much better to do this cooperative thing together. Um, wow, wow. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I have I have seven of them, and my for a while my mother was buying one every month before the pandemic. Um, my question is, what is what is the hardest one you have? I have a friend who got the the octopus and said it was really hard. And then the other thing is, when when can we get the three dances? Because my mother and I were eyeing <laughs> that as a big grand week long event. Yeah. Well, the three grants, the three dances are, are three different paintings by Renoir and kind of stitched together with a fancy border. That one is really, really hard to manufacture. It causes us a ton of headache. And so we just have it temporarily delisted because uh, right, you know, right now we just need to move as fast as possible. Um, Jolie, can you hold up that Shamsa sunburst again? This is one of my favorite puzzles. Uh, I love this image. It really has some homogenous uh, colors, which makes it really hard. Um, and it's got a really, really cool cut pattern. It's one of my favorite ones of all time. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, in terms of what is our hardest puzzles, um, first of all, the number one indicator for difficulty is puzzle size. So just sheer number of pieces. That would be the number one. Number two is what does that image look like? Um, is, if it's relatively homogenous, um, we have two different ones called water lilies. One of them is a Monet. Another one is a Alice Sheila. Yeah, um, Sheila. Something like that. Um, both of those are really hard. Um, anything by Gustav Klimt is homogenous and absolutely impossible. Uh, if you want something hard, go look at our, our pear tree or apple tree by Klimt. Uh, but again, anything by Klimt. Um, so if, if you look at an image and you're like, wow, I bet that would be hard. Uh, you're right. That it's going to be hard. So you can kind of tell um, just by looking at the image. An octopus is supposed to an be An octopus really, is impossible. Really hard <laughs> because it's made with all these little octopi. And um, it was drawn by our puzzle designer to be extremely hard. Do either of you ever do puzzles for fun yourself? Or are you just puzzled out? No, we do a lot of puzzles. <laughs> we do, as a family, we do a lot. But especially in the past, I don't know, three weeks, we've just, we bring a lot of puzzles home. And we, we like to know what the template looks like and, and just get a sense of what is hard and what's not. And um, it's just been fun to do some of the newer images. We tend to like, do it for a while and then we'll take a break. Um, having Christmas and going on vacation, 
up to the mountains. That's a definite great time to bring a puzzle. We do puzzles. Question: um, Can a artist submit to you for for your consideration? They do, and we get that quite a bit. And um, um, of all the artists who have uh, who have sent in, we've probably chosen you know two or three of those, maybe 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 half a dozen um, over the years. Um, usually, it's us finding them. Um, a lot of people ask, like, how do you find your images? Um, that's the best part of our job. We love that. Um, I mean, you go into a restaurant and you go to the restroom and there's some back hallway and they've got posters on the wall. Boom. I mean, right there, you might find something incredible. Uh, it's, it's just, we're constantly on the lookout. We tell all of our staff to be constantly on the lookout for new puzzles. And it's an uh, I know it when I see it kind of thing. It's like, oh, my God, that would be a great puzzle. Um, you can these days you can snap a photo of something that you see with your cell phone and you can enter that into Google Images and it'll go find it for you. It is a it kind of a double question. There's the different styles of of tiling is which a puzzle really is a form of tiling. Now some of the tiling trip techniques the tiles look the same but they'll only go together one way over the whole puzzle. And if you did a homogenous picture on a tiling puzzle like that, I think that would be insanely difficult. <laughs> it, it definitely would be. And we have some whimsy pieces that are like that, where it's like a spiral piece where four or five different pieces fit in. And we figured out early on that we couldn't have those be able to be interchangeable because it confuses a lot of people. That was the other question I was gonna ask is, in the old days with cardboard puzzles, if you were doing it, especially if you were a kid, oh, I can get this piece to fit, and you just push it in <laughs> until it fits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we try and make it so that you can't do that because we have found that people do get confused. And um, if it's a subtle image where you can't see the gradient of the color and that you have it wrong, then the, then all these other pieces don't start going together. Yeah. So we do try and avoid that. Do you ever donate your puzzles for charity, for instance, for um, a scholarship? We do a, a lot, a lot of donation. Um, we are more local with that. We give to schools, we give to auctions. We have given to office, uh, law offices, um, just for them to have them in their uh, waiting area. Um, we give, um, locally all the time. It's harder to give to uh, places that are not as local just because we're, we don't know the, the um, organization as well. And people come to us all the time. Yeah, we get, we get so, many, um, so many requests for that, that we just decided we got to keep it all local here in Colorado. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it is overwhelming the number of requests. Question, do you have any more pictures of your shop? I don't find myself going to Boulder anytime soon. <laughs> okay. And, and I'm, I'm very, but I definitely want to go there and I want to do one of your tours. Um, anytime, what can you show me? What can we show? What, what the store, we... the storehouse. I don't know how to get it to. What if we go into, I can't get into. Um... Because um, you let me, Ed, Ed we'll let me, let, let's take a couple other questions and we'll work okay. on this in the background here. Okay. Incidentally, uh, just <clears throat> during the silence, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, I uh, invite you to, we don't have a date yet, and of course, uh, I get these gigs because I sleep with the uh, president of, um, <laughs> of uh, San Diego Mensa. <laughs> but ask Mr. Grammar guy. Only if you're good, Rich. <laughs> oh, you know I'm good. Huh? Um, <laughs> but at, at any rate, uh, you know, really trying to keep this once a month at least. <clears throat> I think most of you know me as the uh, language columnist for more than a quarter of a century uh, for uh, the Mensa Bulletin. And uh, by the way, I received more than 500 entries to the recent contest 
uh, results will be in March on uh, collective nouns and making your own ones. A lot of them really brilliant. There's one more week left to enter that contest, incidentally, if you'd still like to, they're still eligible. But <clears throat> I'm former usage editor of the Random House Dictionary of the English Language. And what happened is after the uh, Christmas concert that Bill Shipper and I did, we got so many questions about grammar, and I mean a long time. I loved it. And they were mostly about grammar that we said, hey, let's do a, a show on that. So I will speak for about 20 minutes whenever that is in February. Notice I pronounce both R's. And uh, any questions you have uh, about, uh, you know, um, they is the uh, third person singular, or uh, does the period go inside or outside the end quotation? <laughs> uh, Chris Worth will remember some of the stuff from St. Paul School, but uh, uh, what's the difference between which and that in an adjective clause? I'm going to be there to answer, and I hope to take the bulk of the time on your question. A custom CAD file for the cut, and then you cut it yep. out the way they want to cut it. Yep, they, uh, we had we do get that request from time to time, which we turn down. Uh, we can't deal with that. That um, that you know they their their cut pattern might not work for one reason or another. Um, it's a, it's a file format thing as well. It complicates our process. We really are trying to move as fast as we can here, and so that that is not allowed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who's our new class doing? I've got a question. Yep. Um, your store. Yes. Is, if, I have a friend that lives in the Denver area. Mm -hmm. Could he come to the store and buy a puzzle? Yeah, we are now. <laughs> we are now open to um, letting customers in. I think it's four to six at a time. And um, recently, the past week, we haven't sold out as quickly as normal so we do we are open this past weekend we were open to having customers come in and there's a whole okay. shelf yeah that's a good question dave it's been a real struggle um you know with thirty thousand people waiting in line uh, on our website proper um so what happens is we are trying to make those puzzles as fast as we can every day. Um, we release them. So on, at any given time, we have about a 1500 tracking list um, of orders that we have and that we're trying to make. And so we'll make a, a Van Gogh Starry Night and that will come to the top of our, our job initiator, the guy who's making the puzzle prints and starting the process. He's like our quarterback. Um, and so he'll look down the list and he'll say, oh, there's four starry nights on here for Van Gogh. Uh, I'm gonna make six just in case we have a failure. And then any of that overage that comes through our process, that ends up being stacked up and goes down to our store um, once a week. And that's how we get product out of the store. So the store right now is only open three days a week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's still an online ordering thing for pickup. So on Friday, they release a third of it. Saturday, they release. Sunday, they release. Um, and people can uh, place their order starting at 10 a.m. each of those days, then they can come pick it up. And then everything that's overage from that that hasn't sold on the website, people can come in and browse. So it's complicated, it's painful. Um, it's been an iterative process for us to try and figure out how to make this work and keep our doors open down there. Um, so it, it has been nothing short of a, a monumental challenge for us um, with the pandemic. How much inventory do you have in your store? Zero. Well, okay. right now we do have some puzzles that didn't sell this weekend, but it's a it's a handful. A few, but I mean, normally at our factory, we will build up during the year um, ahead of the holidays, and then it all gets kind of liquidated in December. So usually we're just bristling with inventory by early midsummer. Um, but due to the demand situation right now, we have zero inventory at all. And we have a lot of unused space where we used to have inventory shelves and now we're using it for other purposes. Another kind of a, another technical question would be, 
have you ever thought about the old techniques? There were there were two different techniques. 3M used to make a photo uh, proofing process for doing color photos for people who are doing newspapers and stuff like that. So it's films, and you had the three color films, and you just lay them on top, which you could glue together. And you could also do the same thing as Technicolor did, which you could do the dye transfer and print your full color on your on your surface and those would think to be faster than a than a color printer because a color printer you know is that raster scan and takes a while totally um we did explore that technology and there are some uh, manufacturers out there that use that technology just right onto the substrate um printing like that um that printing I think is a lot more labor intensive in terms of the machine and the uh, the maintenance on that. Um, and uh, in I, I think in point of fact, you're right. It would it could save some time, but overall, I think it would cost us more time. And um, and the the way I mean, we there's also a uniformity issue with printing directly onto wood. Um, you know, that maple is, is somewhat uniform, but it's got its irregularities. And we really need, that's the most important part of our process is the image. It real that color needs to pop off that page. And so we, we use like this, the, the special combination of what we've come up with, um, with, with that, just that in mind, you know, we really want that color popping. Yeah. Any other questions? I would just like to say congratulations on number one, being a visionary, number two, executing it so well, and number three, just I mean, such an incredible backlog of demand. I mean, congratulations. I'm just ecstatic for you, and I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I feel very, very, very lucky. Um, I love my job. I know a lot of people in the world don't love their jobs. I feel very lucky every single day coming to work. And, um, and then, uh, as my dad would say, if he's still on the call, don't say you, you're lucky. Uh, you worked so hard for this. And that's true. Also, um, we have worked really, really, really hard um, to become students of this game and just working hard in general. And um, uh, it's been a wonderful journey. And uh, again, you know, I feel so, so lucky. The harder you work, the luckier you get, usually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, with, with, with Ed's question, uh, I, I was frozen out when I asked it, but do you have images of your workplace on your website, Chris? Um, do, do you? We should. Do you want to show them some of these? Yeah. So, Ed, that's, you know, one way you can uh, get to that. I considered that. Um, I'm sure. I'm going to show you a couple right now on my phone. Um, How do we show them? Um, okay, hang on a second. And hey, just Charlie? By, the, by the way, for everybody, uh, Chris's background is he was an attorney and financial analyst. So he did a, a turnaround and, and took a different path. So That's nice, <laughs> right. Yeah. Is part of the question for me, uh, Richard? Well, I was just saying, you mentioned way back about, <clears throat> do you do it in one fell swoop? And I wanted to swoop down and say, people generally don't know the origin of that and what fell means. It's from Macbeth, the play, <laughs> and uh, it, it is uh, Macduff saying to Macbeth, in one fell swoop, felonious swoop is what that fell means. You slaughtered all my pretty ones. So <laughs> way back when you said that, it's just how Shakespeare gets into our language. And Chris knows about that because I taught a Zoom class recently uh, with uh, a number of his uh, mates at St. Paul's School. Okay, sorry. I'm a teacher on the <laughs> Pulse place, and Share. Go ahead. Um, another place you can see photos uh, is on our Facebook page. If you just do a search for Liberty Puzzles, uh, I'm sorry if that sounds inadequate. I really tried to cover a lot of ground tonight. Um, and, um, you know, there's some parts that we don't generally like to show in public. We do used to do public tours um, before pre-pandemic, and we will go back to that. Um, but I guess, I think you're right. There's, 
we have we also commissioned a, a photographer to take photos of our people, uh, not necessarily showing our proprietary processes, but showing them working. And we have the huge blow ups of those down in our downtown store to show people. Um, so I apologize in general. You could see some photos on our Facebook page. You can also go to our website, libertypuzzles.com. If you search, if you look on, if you click on the news um, button you can see some other photos of stuff, including the most spectacular uh, falls puzzle that we have, which is a map of the British Isles. Um, I think it's about 1600 pieces and it is incredible. Well, well no apologies, uh, Chris. All we can say is, oh, for Abjus Day, Kalu Kalei, we chortle in our joy from Jabberwocky, of course, uh, which by the way, is gonna be a theme of our regional gathering this year. It's the uh, 150th anniversary of, of the publication, five years after Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. But just what Menson's all about, learning dressed up to have fun and self-actualization in your case. Uh, and of course, I thank my dear wife for making this happen. I would like to make another suggestion. Chris, um, this is such a great presentation. Please repeat it at one of our, um, at the annual gathering or the world gathering. If you, I don't know if you're going this summer or not, but this would be wonderful, wonderful. And I'm sure it would help sales pop even more so. You <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Believe me, yeah. Ed, I was thinking of that. Actually, uh, Chris, although he certainly could be, uh, is not in, in Mensa. And I told him it's very easy. You just have to get a perfect hundred on your IQ test. But <laughs> we haven't gotten into that. And and just for everybody to remind everybody that this will be on our YouTube channel, so that if you have friends that are puzzle fanatics, they can just go to that and they will be able to see the whole thing. May may I add that 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 somebody showed up at our gathering in 2018 in Georgia with this puzzle. Oh my God. And from that, you got the seven sales because I got seven puzzles here. And I think, <laughs> and my mother was buying one a month because she got into the animals. So I think, I think my mother has like maybe 15 now. So that was because one person showed up with this at a Mensa gathering. <laughs> Yeah, we, Jolie, we haven't done any marketing in uh, about 10 years, actually. It's all word of mouth. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to follow up, Rich, um, on your, uh, uh, you know, we have two sayings, kind of taglines here. One is external, and that is sit long, talk much. And that, then we have another one, which is internal, which is if it's not fun, we're not doing it. That's so great. So this has really been so much fun tonight. Thank you guys, really.